why unvented roofs are best for custom homes. I find this to be a difficult topic to teach because people really tend to feel entitled to the lowest cost design solutions in all situations. But design really is about trade-offs and it's often the case that some of the most elegant, low cost building science solutions that work just fine in simple houses stop being appropriate for custom homes. Vented roofs fall into that category. Let's talk about why. First, why do we vent roofs? I teach a different short course that goes into more detail on this topic, but the short answer is we vent roofs to control moisture in attics. It's a beautifully inventive and low cost approach to dealing with moisture and it works in every climate. We'll draw in exterior air at the soffit and that air will exhaust out at the ridge, picking up moisture along the way. The moisture, by the way, comes from the interior, typically from occupants, cooking, cleaning, breathing, whatever. Warm, moisture-laden interior air will escape into the attic through discontinuities in the ceiling. And once in the attic, that air will find plenty of cold surfaces and condensation will occur. Speaking of condensation, it will occur when moisture, usually moisture-laden air, comes into contact with a cold surface. In building design, we have four approaches to dealing with condensation. We can, one, warm the condensing surface, no cold surface, no condensation. Two, we can prevent moisture from reaching the cold surface. Three, we can remove moisture from the environment by dehumidifying, for example. And four, we can allow the condensation to occur, but make it so that it's not problematic by using less moisture sensitive materials and or removing moisture by providing drying. In venting roofs, we're pursuing the second strategy by attempting to make the ceiling relatively airtight. It's not perfect, but we can certainly reduce how much moisture gets into the attic. And we also pursue that fourth strategy by using exterior air to flush out moisture and provide drying. We also rely on daytime drying from the sun. Attics get pretty hot, right? It's really very elegant. We reach this balance between wetting and drying that doesn't exceed the safe storage capacity of the building materials. And like I said, this approach works everywhere. But it doesn't work on all types of homes. There are four conditions that can make venting insufficient and potentially very problematic. The conditions are one, complicated roof lines, two, lots of penetrations through the ceiling, three, mechanical equipment in the attic, and four, very well insulated ceilings. I should note that each of these conditions by itself is enough to raise the risk sufficiently to avoid venting. Custom homes, of course, often feature all four, but let's go through them individually and then discuss the design alternatives to venting. Complicated roof lines can make venting insufficient for pretty obvious reasons. In venting, we're relying on exterior air to provide drying, and if there isn't a clear path from soffit to ridge, we don't get the drying we're depending on. It's really that simple. Similarly, if the roof is low slope, we won't get sufficient air exchange. And if we attempt to compensate for having a low slope roof or complicated roof lines by using an exhaust fan, we can make things even worse for ourselves. The fan will pull air from the easiest source and often the easiest source is from inside the home. And this is dangerous from a moisture perspective, but it's also dangerous from a fire control perspective. For venting to work, we need to be doing it with exterior air and there needs to be a clear path from soffit to ridge. If we cannot work this into the design, we should not be venting, period. This means no venting for complicated roof lines and no venting for low slope roofs. The second condition that can make venting insufficient is when there are lots of penetrations through the ceiling and custom homes have a lot of penetrations through the ceiling. We tend to have all kinds of specialty lighting and services that require us to put holes in the ceiling. 
It's very difficult to seal these well enough to sufficiently control how much moisture gets into the attic. Now one solution here is to drop the ceiling a bit to provide a service cavity between a fully continuous airtight plane and the finished ceiling. This is a reasonable approach when it's the only factor on our list. The third condition that can make venting insufficient is when the mechanical equipment is located in the attic. This is a problem for two reasons, and it's worth spending some time on each one. Let's take a look at what happens to the pressure relationships in a house when the mechanical equipment is in the attic. We'll have an air handler with ducts attached to it. Some of the ducts will supply conditioned air into the occupied space, and some will return air from the occupied space back to the air handler. So it's a closed loop. When the amount of air supplied to the space is equal to the amount of air that gets returned to the air handler, nothing happens. We're at equilibrium. But what happens if the ducts leak? When the ducts leak, we end up removing more air from the occupied space than we supply to the space. And this causes the house to become depressurized. And when the house is depressurized, will induce exterior air into the space to make up for the losses in the attic. This is a huge problem. It's a huge problem because we don't know where that air is really coming from. We're just pulling it through defects in the enclosure's air control membrane and filtering it through whatever's in our walls and foundations. It's also a problem because we're not just drawing air into our space, we're also bringing in whatever's in the air, including moisture. This is a particular problem in humid climates. Not only does this humid air make occupants uncomfortable, but it can also cause condensation and mold on cold interior surfaces. But what if we just seal the ducts? If we do a good job, we don't depressurize the house and we can avoid this problem. But remember I told you mechanical systems in attics actually create two problems for us. This was just the first. The second problem is condensation on the ducts themselves. Yes, we insulate ducts, but not enough to prevent condensation entirely. This used to not matter as much because even though we'd get condensation on cold ducts, they'd dry out before anything really got damaged. We can't count on that drawing in the same way that we used to for a couple reasons. One, we're getting better at sizing our mechanical equipment, so it's smaller and operates for longer. This is great and definitely more efficient, but it means that the ducts are colder for longer, meaning more condensation, more water in the attic. Two, we've switched from black roofs to reflective roofs or other cooler roof systems. This reduces how hot it gets in the attic, which means we get less drying. Our duct condensation problem is similarly compounded when it's not sunny out during the day. When the attic doesn't get as hot, we'll get less drying, and that's obviously a problem if we're depending on that drying to, uh, to deal with the condensation on the ducts. The fourth condition that can make venting insufficient is when we use a lot of insulation in the ceiling, perhaps because we're in a cold climate or maybe we wanna hit a particular energy standard. Now, typically, these homes will have an airtight ceiling because the designer and contractor are attentive to energy efficiency, which is great, but not great enough. Even though the amount of moisture in the attic is small, we simply don't get enough heat loss into the attic to provide sufficient drying. This is worst in the Pacific Northwest where it's cool, cloudy, and humid. So yes, vented roofs are terrific, but only on homes with simple roof lines, with minimal ceiling penetrations, no mechanical equipment in the attic, and those that aren't super insulated in cloudy climates. Let's talk now about our alternatives. Instead of venting our attics to remove moisture, we can condition the attic. Basically, we bring the attic into the conditioned part of the enclosure. When we do this, we want to make sure that we provide mechanical conditioning to this space just as we would any other room in the house. Conditioned attics have some obvious drawbacks. 
For one, when we insulate along the roof rather than on the flat, we have more surface area to cover, which means we require more insulation. But it's not just that we need more of it, we also need to use a different kind of insulation. If we insulate on top of the roof sheeting, we'll be using some kind of rigid insulation and those are more expensive. If we insulate on the underside of our roof sheathing, we'll likely be using spray foam insulation, which is also more expensive. Couple notes here. One is that in conditioning our attic, we're adopting a different approach to moisture control. Let's revisit that list of possible ways of dealing with condensation. If we insulate on top of our sheathing, we're using that first approach of warming the condensing surface. If we insulate with spray foam on the underside of our sheathing, we're using that second approach of preventing moisture from reaching the cold surface because the spray foam is airtight. In either insulation strategy, we're also removing moisture from the environment by providing conditioned air to the attic. Remember, we need to treat the attic like any other room in the house, and this will have the effect of dehumidifying it a bit. What we're not doing though is pursuing that fourth option. We're no longer providing drying by venting. Another thing to note is that for this strategy to work, we need to use enough insulation to keep the roof sheathing warm enough to prevent condensation. And this is obviously going to be climate dependent. The colder the climate, the more insulation we need. And if we're insulating on the underside of the roof sheathing, we also need to use the right kind of insulation to make sure we prevent enough moisture from reaching that cold surface. And this is also climate dependent. The ins and outs of this are a bit beyond the scope of this discussion, but what you'll wanna do is follow the ratios in this table, which is derived from the building code. The table shows how much rigid insulation you'll need as a percentage of the total insulation used in the roof assembly. Note that the percentage of exterior insulation required to control condensation increases as the climate gets colder. If you're not using rigid insulation and are using spray foam, instead, the same ratios apply. The spray foam counts as exterior insulation for the purposes of condensation control. You must use the more vapor closed, closed cell variety of spray foam in climate zones five and higher. In milder climates, you may use either variety, either open or closed cell. The last technical note is that sometimes we want both a conditioned attic and a vented roof to control ice damming. There are a few approaches to this, but this one is my favorite. It's essentially a heavily insulated roof with a vented over roof on top. The most important component is that fully adhered membrane air barrier on top of the uh, tongue and groove decking. Finally, these are, of course, just a handful of approaches to unvented roofs. There are certainly lots of others. These are just some popular options that illustrate the moisture control principles that we've discussed. Roofs are complicated, and I cover them in a lot more detail in my course, Building Science for Architects, which is available at buildingsciencefightclub.com.